Hello and welcome to the That's So Craven podcast, your Fulham podcast from Down Under. And we are here today, not because we want to, but because we have to, to discuss a terrible game against Nottingham Forest, a 3-1 loss where Fulham looked as bad as I've seen them look in a number of years. Here to talk it all through and get all of this out of our system. Skibby, how are we going today? Deflated. Broken. I, I don't know what. There's so many different feelings I have. And it's almost one of those where you think it's died down and then I start thinking about it again and you just get more and more angry. So, yeah, it's just... Ah, anyone but Forrest, that's my thing. But anyway, yeah, other than that, everything's fine. But yeah, deflated, I think is a word. And Dad, how are we going today? Yeah, um, well, um, it's been a, been a long day. Uh, I, well, I, I was always going to have a difficult day today. And then I, uh, at, at very late notice, I, I watched the replay to this game. And um, just had even more to reflect on. Um, yeah, let's let's get into it. Yeah, we all seem super chipper today, so it's going to be fun. Um, but let's let's make this a cathartic experience instead, and and try and look for some positives here. A three-one loss to Forest again before the Sheffield United game. We sort of said the same thing. This is a bit of a must-win, but. It's, it's very Fulham-esque to slip up in these situations. We did so against Sheffield. At least we got ourselves back in the game a little bit there and pulled off the draw. This one, there's none of those positive feelings afterwards. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered. A, a, a really, It's not just the loss. You can take a loss sometimes, but it's the manner in which we lost and the manner in which the, the majority of the players out on the pitch went about it. Um, Skibby, I'll, I'll throw to you first because uh, you've had more sleep than most of us. H how did you feel this first half went just as an overall summary? Because it, it was, it just felt like a disaster from minute one. I mean, the fact that you think I got more sleep is a very safe assumption. I think this kept me up all <laughs> night. Just Gibbs White, just his face taunting me. Um, no, it was one of those where, like you say, on paper, we were really should have been the stronger side. We were the stronger side. Let's put it this way. More in form. Um, and you just thought very much like Sheffield United. It was one of those where, you know, you can't overlook three points. And it's it's almost the manner of the way that the game started, which really set the tone for the entire half. I could not tell you one player who looked who, who kind of broke a jog, to be honest. It was just shambles to watch. Um, and it was easy. And I think even though it was sort of almost like a self-harming type um, activity, I, I looked at the goals and watched more of the goals and just tried to pick out where everything was going wrong. And it just seemed to be the line of engagement for Fulham was just really too high. The, the defence was way too high. The centre mids were just way too high. I think that's probably one of the most advanced positions I've seen Polina in in a long time. And it's almost like a uh, an arrogance or... Um, I mean, it, it, it's borderline arrogance, but more ignorance, I think, of the way that they tried to set up and take the game to, to Forest and just didn't expect them to basically be kind of as um, explosive on the counter as they were. And before the first goal, we saw signs that he was coming. And I think before Hudson-Odoi did take the lead, just Tete was well out of position. I think there was a um, in the um, one of the attacks, it may have even been the goal, which was just Tosin and Bassi just didn't know where they were on the pitch. And then Tete was around 10 yards off of hudson Adoy, And that just sort of set the, the parameter for the game. Everyone was about 10 yards off the pace and just seemed to be out of position. And no one knew what their roles were. And then Forrest just seemed to be finding these gaps, which we left way wide, wide open, which I don't think it... I, I'm not going to compliment Forrest and say that they are a, a top, top side because they're not. They're, they didn't play like a... a a very solid Premier League side, but for me, they just played like a team 
who are in the Premier League, but they're going to punish you if they just find those gaps that any professional team would. I think even if we played a championship side yesterday, they would find the same gaps. They'd find the same um, kind of just the, the, the tactical holes that Fulham left and will hurt you. And we just didn't manage to plug those holes for about, I don't know, a good 40 minutes, 45 minutes even. It, it was it was baffling. The the and I I think more so because you look back over the last um well a couple of months, let's say, and you look back at the Man United victory, victory over Brighton, the victory over Spurs, where this is a, a well oiled machine where we've we've worked out what our best eleven is, and even with a few people coming in and out, we still managed to get results and, and perform at a certain level. But we like you said, everyone was 10 yards off the pace. Um, there's a lot of blame going to Tete and Tosin. And I, I think they they deserve some of the blame, but really it's across the whole park. It's probably the worst game I've seen from Polina in his couple of years at the club. Um, L- Lukic looked off the pace compared to what he's been like in the last couple of months. There, there was no one really, apart from, I'd say, Andreas Pereira, who really looked like they were having a good game early doors. Um Dad, going into this and off the back of the Sheffield game, do you think maybe the good result against Sheffield in terms of turning around um, the the 3-1 deficit, do you think maybe we didn't really get the kick up the arse that we needed going into this Forest game and and it kind of showed on the pitch? So I'm going to go back even further than that. Um, Full disclosure, I, I was meant to be talking about this tonight. I uh, I thought I'd arranged the night off, but um, and and so what I thought I did was find buy myself some time to watch this at, at, at some later stage today to catch up on the chaos that I was hearing from you guys. And it's always that weird experience when you haven't watched it live, you know the result, you hear the full analysis and commentary um, in bits and pieces and you haven't actually formed a view yourself. Well, I, I, I very quickly had to form a view and I finished it about a minute ago before we started talking. And um, I'm, I'm going to come in here with a very contra opinion and tell you that I actually, I actually – don't think Fulham were that terrible. I think the result is awful. But I actually don't think we were that terrible. We had moments. And gr- granted, we we overall we weren't great in the first half. Second half uh, was markedly better. But I'm trying to I'm trying to understand what it was. And it if you look at the first goal, um, K- Kenny. Tete looks rusty. He he just doesn't look sharp. He's standing off, and, and he, he's a good player one one on one. It's not like he was out of position and then tracking back and miles off it and gets slipped and the guy's through and he scores. He's standing off him, but he his timing seems to be wrong. He he's about a half a second late in actually trying to block that shot, and he just looks really rusty. I, I don't. I'm not sure why Castagna didn't play. Uh, Forgive me if I if I've missed something. Is Castagna injured? Has he been rested? I think it was Um, just just general rotation, which is probably the reason for Wilson as well. Yep. So you know, as we said a couple of days ago, we've we've got a pretty important game. Not that this was unimportant, but we've got a important opportunity coming up uh, on Saturday against Newcastle, and I'm sure that was not even in the back of uh, Marco's mind, which possibly forced, maybe forced him to overthink his squad rotation and who should be rested, which I think destabilized us a lot. If I know Castagna's had a lot of work to do over recent weeks, but he's also been one of our best players for the season. Highly reliable. He's, you know, I think he's absolutely key to that back four. And it doesn't take much to destabilize this back four, however good they're playing. It doesn't take much. And I'm, I'm just thinking, um, and honestly, uh, you know, beyond um, Castagna and 
Tete, the Castagna and Tete conversation. I, I heard you guys talking about Tosin. Honestly, over the whole 90 minutes, I actually didn't think he was that bad. And I, I think I'm well placed to talk about Tosin. I'm the first guy to jump on his ass if I think there's any laziness, any cockiness, any whatever, or just just sort of when Tosin puts himself in that position to 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 make those unforced errors, it's so annoying. I've come to know with Tosin that those balls he plays out into midfield, those piercing balls that often look so high risk, he wouldn't keep doing that and keep getting selected if Marco Silva didn't actually want him to play that way. I'm, I'm certain he wants him to play that way and be the guy who actually breaks us out of defence. Now, there wasn't a lot of that last night. That's not what, what actually went on. But what I'm saying is... Uh, I, I don't. I actually don't think Tosin was that bad. He he had a terrible first fifteen minutes, but we just didn't look switched on. This is the Premier League. It's it's very very high standard of of professional sport, and we always talk about the top four six clubs who will punish you if you make mistakes or you're just not on your game or you give them an opportunity. But every single club in the Premier League has got a couple of players who can do it to you. Let's be honest. So it's it's not something that is the exclusive territory of those top clubs. Honestly, I, I, I thought my overall position, because I'm absolutely fresh on this, uh, I, I just watched the whole damn thing. And I thought we were poor in the first half, but they took their chances. They should have had a yet another goal in the first half at around the 15 minutes. Could have been worse. But we actually created a lot of chances in that game, as did they. And things were going off the crossbar, off the, the upright really good balls into the box. It just went wide. On any other day, they go in, score lines different. I think what we're absolutely and utterly miserable about is the result against Nottingham Forest, who aren't in great form. We, sh- we should have put them away. Yeah, look, I, I think that it's it's hard to say. I know you're saying Tosin wasn't that bad across the whole 90 minutes, but the problem as a defender is if you make one or two mistakes – it costs you goals. And, and okay. usually we, we're kind of lucky that against lower, lower level teams in the premier league, like Nottingham forest and Sheffield United, those mistakes usually go unpunished because we've got Leno sweeping up behind or Robinson or Bassey coming in to sort of save the day. What's happened in the last two games is every mistake has been punished and cost us a goal. And you have to start looking at it and going to, do uh, can we afford these mistakes across the whole of a season when Absolutely. points are at such a premium? You, you kind of have to attribute blame to that and say it's not good enough for but, a Premier League player, especially a defender, which is such a key position, to be making those kind of mistakes. It goes beyond that. It's not only that we make mistakes and get punished for them, which is a bit of misfortune because I, I've actually seen Fulham this season play worse than we did for the first 15 to 20 minutes last night. Honestly, I, I reckon I have. Don't ask me to quote you when that was, but I, I just have a kind of sense that, yeah, it was a couple of really awful moments. Defending was terrible, but I'm not – I think I think we're pissed about the result, right? rightfully so. I think it's a – you know, we, we, we felt we were going to get at least a point, maybe three, even though <laughs> statistically – Probably had no right to because we it wasn't a away game, remember. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think not only were we really poor for let's say 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes until that substitution, a triple substitution, but we, we, you, you can't get away from the, the, the other problem that we had, which is a major theme running through this last couple of years. We, we so often go through phases, like multiple weeks, where we don't create enough opportunities. That's not the case at the moment. We actually created a lot, but we can't execute and put it away, even against ordinary sides. Looks like a bit of misfortune, but at this level, those fine margins, as a good man used to talk about, are the difference. You know, they're, they're, they're incredible opportunities, some of those. And, you know, 
it always looks unlucky when you hit the crossbar. But, you know, another man's uh, description of that might be poorly directed. Skibby, your your thoughts yeah. on that because I think you're, you're <laughs> I, probably I, on the glum side. I, I yeah, I was going to counter that. I think not being the worst performance of Marco Silva's reign. I think watching that game yesterday, every time we gave the ball away in the midfield, it felt like Forest were going to score, and it actually almost did. I mean, the first twenty minutes before the sub, I reckon we could have been four or five nil down. I think. Um, Bern Leno made a couple of really good saves and there was just, yeah, it's just really strange of, like I talked about that line of engagement, it's just Tete seemed to be really high up the field but usually when we do that we normally have Polina or the other centimetre, Lukic I suppose sort of covering that area which just didn't seem to happen and mm -hmm. hudson Adoy just had absolute free roam uh, which was just painful to watch. Um, and, I mean, you talk about Tosin, yeah, he didn't have a great game. and But I think there's a point which somebody made in the chat, uh, T4, exactly on the money and exactly how I felt, which was just the midfielders just were nowhere and Polina just wasn't anywhere. And the, where, where I saw that was the Gibbs-White goal. Wasn't world-class, mm. was completely simple. But if you watch the, the passage of play, I think Danilo, he, he plays a one-two off Danilo and Danilo is there holding midfielder and Danilo picks the ball up sort of, I don't know, 10 yards outside the box. Kearney is nowhere near him. He's, he's yeah. about five yards still up the field. Mm -hmm. And then Polina doesn't follow Gibbs White or anyone follow Gibbs White. And then basically Padillo just gets the ball, takes it on. Oh, look, one-two, he's through, goal. And it was so easy. And it's almost like... Mm -hmm. That without that centre mid protection, Tosin and Bassi, fair enough, they didn't really stand a chance. But yeah, when you want to be, but then there's elements where, you know, the rumours are if you believe them, believe it, or if you don't believe them, that he wants to be or is expected to be one of the top earners of the club. You expect a better showing from your centre back, who's the top earner of the club, just hands down. And I mean, yeah, the one thing I will say is that the subs, there are managers out there who would kind of go, oh, let's get into half time and, and, and regroup and see where we're at. I commend Silver for saying this isn't going. We need to make drastic changes. And three changes after 30 minutes, yeah, those boys who got taken off are going to feel pretty pretty crappy. But at the same time, I'm glad he did it. And that's the kind of manager that I want. Now there's going to be a big ask of the character from, you know, from Iwobi, from... Lukic and from Wilson just to say and I know Silver came out and said they're not the problem players but we needed to fix something and they were the ones that we needed to, to, to sort of be replaced to fix it but now you've got to be looking at Lukic, Wilson Iwobi not so much, I think Iwobi's pretty safe I think but can they bounce back and say you know I, I did get subbed after 30 minutes but you know is that going to, am I going to just sort of wallow in my sadness and you know, be really sad about it, or am I is that going to push him on? And I hope it's the latter, I really do. But I think the, the, the subs really did help. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I saw on Twitter earlier someone mentioning that, um, in regards to the substitutions and those players who did get pulled off and how they bounced back, the, the last mm -hmm. time that kind of happened was Yukanovich pulling off Stefan Johansson after. 20 or 30 minutes in in a similar situation mm. and Johansson bounced back to be one of our key players going forward for, for years after that so you yeah. do hope that um these guys and, and as, as silver sort of said the it, the players who were pulled off it wasn't their fault that we were losing i don't think that was the point the point was we weren't as he said that there's a certain type of standards and they were not happening on the pitch in the first half and so he made some changes to try and get back to that point. And and, yeah. and I, I'm I loved the fact that he made those changes after 30 minutes. I think um we we harp on about Silver not making changes uh quick enough during games and, and often not seeing subs until the 78th minute when you really want them in the 60th minute. The fact that he's come out and sent a message by pulling off three key players and big names early doors 
is kind of good for me. I'm glad. And it, it's a bit of a indication from Marco as well to say, yep. Yeah, uh, and I, he hasn't said this, but I think it, it must be him saying that the standard wasn't good enough on the pitch, but also potentially I got the selection wrong. Well, and, that's and... the point. That's the point. Because I, if if he was actually having a crack at particular performances, you, you'd have probably dragged Tosin and Kenny Tete for – gaping hole errors, right? Which but actually, probably would have made the, the issue but, even but worse it, as well. Yeah, and you, that's a difficult thing to do. You go and make wholesale changes at the back, you're you're looking for trouble, and, unless yeah. you've got a Man City level of squad where individuals, those, just, those guys will come on, forget they don't need rhythm. They're just technically and individually that good or keep the ball. Yeah. Um, but not only did he have some problems at the back, but he's suddenly a lot behind. So the changes he's got to make indirectly, yeah, it's because we've made some defensive errors. But actually, what do I now do to change this up so that we can actually score three goals? Mm. Possibly four. That's a lot. <laughs> you know. uh, I mean, it was it was only two nil at the time, but I, I think yeah. it was all about but he, stemming but the flow thinking, at that okay, point. But, that maybe they're going to score another one. So I've got to score four to win. Yeah. I, I mean, Silver's yeah. quote basically said, it's not the fault of the three players because if <clears> in that <throat> moment I could, I would have changed more than three because it was clear <laughs> we were too slow. In mm. our situation, too slow, not dynamic at all, not the right moves, not aggressive at all. And teams in this league can punish you if you're too slow. And they did. Um, we were so, definitely not aggressive enough. There was, and I and I, I thought about it and I, I'm just trying to think, you know, it's, it's that, it's the benefit you do have when you know the result, you know everything that's happened and people are talking about it, and then you watch the game. So you're actually looking for it. So you come, you come in with different eyes rather than, you know, trying to understand what's happening as it's all evolving. And it's, it's quite an interesting thing, thing to do. Uh, <laughs> sidebar, you can actually still get that if you watch it twice. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I think... Um, Maybe it's a fatigue thing as well, because that's what happens when you, you kind of look like you're wandering around. Maybe just knack it. And even though you know where you're supposed to be, your, your body just can't get up for it. They may be professional footballers, but you go through busy periods. And if you get overworked because you've had some tough games, it, it can happen. Um, I, I'm I'm just trying to find reasons rather than poking holes in this, because I actually think we're all, as a community here, suffering excessively from deep disappointment after a kind of expectation that we should have done a whole lot better. And and not just getting like a stupid 2-1 loss, but kind of getting battered, which <clears throat> feels feels awful. Yeah, because you look at them and you go, their results, forget their, their um, points position because we know the background to that, but they actually aren't doing that well. They, of course, they've got some good players, but they're not doing that well. They, they, they uh, haven't been able to. Sorry, Jack. I mean, the, the, the problem here is we, we've we drawn with Sheffield United. We've lost to Forest. Um, there's, for us, seven games left this season. If we had actually won both of those games, which we should have done, we'd be on 44 points at the moment and sitting in eight, well, ninth place. Uh, behind Newcastle on goal difference going into this game against Newcastle this weekend, meaning a win against Newcastle would actually take us to eighth, maybe even seventh. Uh, we've gone from looking genuinely like we could be qualifying for Europe, outside chance, but but a genuine outside chance, to now uh, dropping a position into 13th. We're not looking over our shoulder because Palace are three games behind us in terms of wins, but there was this sort of hope that we'd we'd be pushing up the table and we've missed that opportunity. And those don't come around very often in the Premier League. Like, like we really should have been pushing to finish firmly in the top half. Now it's about maybe crawling up to 10th, maybe 11th. Um, it, it's, it's disappointing is the word because um, it is really disappointing. We, we got ourselves into this great position, and unfortunately we saw it happen last season as well. I think the last 10 games 
we only won two, picked up six points from the last 10 games. And I just, I don't want that feeling again where after such a good season, we just let things sort of slide away. And and people talk about are the players all on the beach and on their holiday already and thinking about next season. And I, I, I really hope not, but the way that we're playing and the, the manner of the defeat makes it feel like we are. Um, let's try and find some positives here. We, we obviously did get one goal back in the second half. Um, for me, big positive, uh, Andreas Pereira, I thought he had a, a great game. Um, he was one of the few standouts of Fulham. Uh, Skibby, uh, Pereira, I like I said, had a good game. Was there anyone else that you can pick out or do you think it was just Andreas, really? I think Robinson, I wouldn't say he had the best game, but I think it was a consistent game. So it was something that we expected. We expected him to get down the wing. We expected him to cause some havoc. I mean, he looked pretty good. I think Andreas, like you say, he was probably the best player on the pitch for me in a Fulham shirt. Leno made some good saves, but again, I, I do blame him for the second goal. I don't, I, there's no way that yeah. should have gone in. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know I what he was doing. Like, it just, it it's was so weirdly, far out. Weirdly flat footed at that point. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't I understand mean, it. Even looking at the different angles, it doesn't make sense. No, it just caught him out. So I think that goes down as a goalkeeper error. But I mean, the, the guys that came on, sort of William, TC, um, Adama, they weren't they weren't fantastic. I think I think Adama still had that kind of final ball problem, which I talked about before, which I've still mm. not sold on. Um, I think Willian and TC they they all were trying this intricate triangle passing, but Forrest just seemed to be much quicker than us, so that seemed to go away. But yeah, it was just I think Andreas for me, and then as soon as Andreas came off, we kind of lost. All of that impetus. Yeah, exactly. Any kind of forward thinking, really. And and poor Muniz was just up there on his own and trying to fight for every little scrap. But he had two centre backs on him, which knew to rough him up a little bit. Um, mm. so he wasn't really getting his game going. But I think I don't think anyone else really could come out with their head held high after that game. I was um almost surprised by how ineffectual Adama was against Olaina. I know Olaina's a good player, we know from his time at Fulham that he can play, but he he almost looked like he outpaced Adama a few times, which was mm. kind of strange to see and, and really pocketed him. And we've seen Adama, how he can just skip away from players. Didn't seem to happen last night. Do you think, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Dad, do you think Adama is proving that he's more of a super sub than a starting player? Because I, I actually like the idea of Adama starting and, and playing a full game, but based on last night, I'm not 100% sold on it anymore. Well, where Adama stands out is if you give him 40 metres to run in. And it, a lot of what he was trying to do last night was fairly close quarters. You know, try to jink a, around and trick in a tricky kind of a fashion, get past a player to put a cross in. And... You know, you'd you'd have to be Usain Bolt to beat someone by a body length over three meters. I mean, he's quick, but no one's really going to be able to put that much distance in between their man over that short distance. So, if you know, if you're playing a long ball over the top and Adama's got even 20, 30 meters, I back him against Oliina, who I, I do think is a a really good player, actually. I, I really like him. I think he's a good player. So I don't think it's any great shame to say that he uh, would Oleina shut Adama Traore out. I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm a, kind of okay with that man on man. I just don't think he got himself into the position that is Traore for to to, to sort of best exploit what he is last night. Um, mm. Just just on the point, I, I I don't think, I think Tom Kearney had a reasonable game, actually. I, I didn't think he was awful last night when he came on. I thought I thought he was all right. Um, I, I, look, I, I think he was okay, but I, across the board, I don't think we 
manage to string any decent passes together. We the, the final ball was always off. Uh, I saw it a few times, mm-hmm. Kenny, just trying to play balls in behind, playing it straight to defenders, which is is very uncanny like. He's he's usually very good at that. Same with Willian and Robinson in that little triangle they were playing. They they it just wasn't coming off. It was it was weird. Mm. Yeah. And some of the Robinson crosses just like he, as soon as he got into a decent area, it just back to being overhit. I don't know whether the, the conditions hindered us a little bit. I mean, I could see the ball every time Kearney tried that long ball down to the sort of for Robinson, it just seemed to skip off the turf and go out. I don't know whether they just maybe it was wetter than they expected. I'm not too sure, but I think yeah, it was really clear how we wanted to play as well. They, they weren't really playing into Muniz's feet. They weren't really doing long balls up the centre. It was always trying to get the ball out wide and get balls into the box for him to attack. And he did attack a couple of them, but we just couldn't get that final ball in. I think potentially that's kind of where you wanted Willian. You needed Willian to start for me. If that is how we're going to play, mm-hmm. then you're not necessarily mm-hmm. going to get decent crosses in from the left with uh, Iwobi on the re- on the left. So I think Willian, for me, had to start there. And then whether you whoever you use on the right just really has to try and use Pereira sort of drifting out wide and, and sort of having those sort of better angled crosses rather than getting to the byline. It seemed to be just the, the no brainer way of playing, but yeah, it just didn't, didn't work. I mean, I suppose that's why you had Wilson. If he, if that's why you wanted to go that way and Wilson had a good cross on him, why not start him on the left, get him sort of attacking Nico Williams and having, instead of having to cut back all the time, but, it was just frustrating all around, really. Mm. I mean, but but still, to to be down two at half time, you know, allow them to three. score three. Was it three at half time? Yeah. yeah, three at half time. Yeah. Okay. Um, three, three. Oh, well, three for the game was what I was going to get to. Um, is is uh, kind of disgraceful against Forest, but you have to admit we could have scored five. Mind you, I think they could have scored five as well. But we 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 had a lot of opportunities, and we I we, think couldn't we, we had some them, half we couldn't chances. put them away. No, no, I thought there were many. Yeah. There were, uh, we we hit the woodwork twice, if I'm not mistaken. Tete, really. Tete headed against the woodwork. That was a Tete. good chance. I'd, good yeah, save. Adama hit the post at the end. Great save. But Adama's one. Uh, yes, there was a good save header. off Tyson's header. Um, you know, I, I, I can't remember now, but there. I was obviously watching with that in mind, thinking, "Yeah, how many opportunities do we are we really creating here, and could we have actually got ourselves substantially back into the match?" And I think we could have, but that's always that's always a weak point of us. Well, firstly, not creating enough opportunities. We seem to be kind of seem to have sort of address that. Um, but as Steve Steve Reynolds said on the live stream. A, a lot of corners, a lot of corners, and a lot of attempts on goal. Uh, Forty-two attempts on goal, goal in the last two games, and only twelve on target. But it says part of it, even when we are on target, we still don't even put it away. Um, so yeah, it's it's disappointing, frustrating. Yeah, it, it it might have been interesting if Tete's header had gone in. I think it was about the sixty-fifth, seventieth minute. Sixty-fifth comes off market. The- Comes off the bottom of the crossbar, falls to Polina. That could have easily sort of deflected its way in or just skipped off the bottom of the crossbar and gone in. That might have made things a little bit interesting because I think we probably would have seen, you know, the Sheffield game as a bit of a template for this one and and maybe getting something back in. But, uh, you know, that's football at the end of the day. I think the the Adama shot against the post, was a, a that's a half chance for me. He's taken a snapshot and... Um, the keeper's covering the near post. It's got to be pinpoint top corner to go in, and it wasn't. Um, but, yeah, look, a, a disappointing result all round, and I think there's a lot of questions to be answered, and um, we do have some questions at the end of the pod, which I will get to, to and, and we can try and answer them. Um, looking at the stats in the game, Fulham with 67% possession, 18 shots on goal to Forrest, 16. Only three shots on target from those 18 on goal. Forrest with just four and scored three of them. Exactly the same stat as Sheffield last week as well. Um, Fulham with 629 passes. 
Um, Forest with just 324. That means in the last two weeks, Fulham have made close to 1,200 passes and um, still not being able to break teams down. Eight corners to the Forest's three, eight fouls to Forest seven. And as Dave um, said, I think this is the first time this season that Fulham haven't picked up a yellow card in a game, um, which, again, speaks to Silver's issues with our aggression. We weren't going in hard and, and breaking play up through kind of tactical fouling, if you will, but we, we didn't assert ourselves on the game in any way. Uh, and I think that is, yeah, it's incredibly disappointing. Um, I'll just jump across to the table quickly. Fulham now actually dropping into 13th place. We'd been talking about how we're staying in 12th for such a long time, but um, we, we're actually dropping now rather than going up, which is the way I thought we'd be going. We do have a nine-point gap to Crystal Palace sitting in 14th place, um, and we are not far behind the teams above us. Um, when you consider Newcastle are only five points ahead of us, but all the teams above us have uh, at least one game in hand. Uh, Chelsea, who are one point ahead of us, actually have three games in hand on us. So um, it, there's the potential, if we don't get a result against Newcastle on the weekend, for us to be slightly cut adrift and sit sort of lonely by ourselves in 13th place. So we do need to start picking up some points if we do have any intention of moving up uh, higher into the table. Let's have a look forward though and talk about the game this weekend and, and actually before I do I'll just send a quick message out to um, the Fulham women's team who play tonight against Dulwich Hamlet um, it's a effectively what you call a semi-final game if they win this game they put themselves in the box seat for the game at Craven Cottage on the weekend if they win the game at Craven Cottage on the weekend they go top of the league with just two games to play after that so a big opportunity for Fulham women's to get promoted finally out of the laser waffle. Good luck to them. Let's talk about Newcastle on the weekend, though. Skibby, how are you feeling going into this game after the debacle of the last couple of days? Well, Fulham's Jekyll and Hyde, isn't it? Home and away. <laughs> Home, we're a completely different team. Um, you know, we've taken the scalps of Arsenal, Spurs, and others. Like, it's basically I was optimistic going into this game uh, even after the Sheffield United game I was thinking oh you know it's a blip it happens but after the Forest one I'm now a little bit unsure I mean Newcastle are still one of those teams who just seem to be sort of limping through the season nowhere near where they were last year um, and they struggle on the road as well um, so my cousin uh, is a Newcastle fan, so he tells me what's going on there when we talk about it. But um, yeah, as the form comparison shows on screen, those following the live stream, <laughs> we're very much neck and neck <laughs> in terms of mm. form, very much a mixed bag. Um, but honestly, I think it depends. I think Ash, um, Ashley Gordon, um, uh, Gordon for Newcastle's back this week, isn't he? I think he only had a one match ban against Everton, which he served yesterday so he'll be back um but i mean for us i'm hoping that you know home advantage bring castagna back in um and you know everyone just gets that swift kick up the backside that they really need um and i think we can really take the game to newcastle and continue our impressive home form but uh that's probably the optimistic side of me but if we play anything like we did in the last two games then it could well be a Another embarrassing loss. Dad, same to you. Skibby's actually made a good point about Newcastle's away form. And I just had a very quick look at the table. Um, Fulham and Newcastle have both picked up only 11 points this season when playing away from home. Um, we, again, very similar in our last 10 games, very similar across the season with our away form. Newcastle have slightly better home form, as you'd kind of expect from a, a squad that they have. Um but Newcastle, they're not they're not travelling overly well. Only three wins on the road this season, and and only two draws as well. Um, with the injuries, and we'll get into the the injury issues that Newcastle have. Do you think this is an opportunity to bounce back for Fulham? Oh, it's it's, it's honestly very difficult to get fired up for this one because every time I think we've worked ourselves into a position where we can actually take advantage of, you know, the situation an opposition is in. They 
they do what they did last night or over the last three or four days and you think well where's this going what 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 are we actually what is well, how how is this really going to end up this season and you know it it's it's astonishing but it, i guess it does speak to the depth and quality that newcastle actually have because they've got so many injured players it's nuts and yet they've still had a reasonably successful season something that we'd be pretty happy with um and if I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know they've got a massive home ground advantage at St. St. James's Park. We talk about it often. It's an incredible advantage. So even if you're on crutches and one leg, that that 12th man will get you home, right? And so you assume that – I mean, I remember the last time they came to Craven Cottage, they were bloody noisy at the Putney end. They were incredibly mm. noisy. <clears throat> so it's not only St. James's Park. It's actually – their fans, <laughs> they're, they're incredible supporters. So, look, I, I I want to believe that we actually can get points and possibly even a win here. You know, ten days ago, I thought I thought this was looming as a winnable game. I, I've been unsettled by the last couple of fixtures. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, we've we've mentioned the unavailabilities a, a few times, so I'll just throw this up. I do have Anthony Gordon in there, but he is back. You're right for this game. Um, but Newcastle missing Sven Botman, Lasalles, Tanali, Lewis Miley, Nick Pope, Callum Wilson, Joe Linton, Livermento, Almiron, Trippier, Matt Target. Um, you know that that's a list of eleven players unavailable. I went through. It's a hundred and Almost 200 appearances in the Premier League this season, 28 players. goals, 24 assists. You could put together a pretty decent Premier League 11 from those guys who are out uh, injured. Um, Newcastle have a massive issue. And, you know, we actually see it every game recently. I think for the last three or four games, Newcastle have lost at least one player to injury during the game. Um, mm. I looked at their bench in the last game and I barely recognized the name, to be honest. Uh, there were a handful of players who who did have to come on, but they they've got like youth just like filling out their benches at the moment. So they've got some big issues, and if we get stuck into them, I feel like this is an opportunity for us. Um, uh, we we've seen what they can do. If you had a look again um, in their game against West Ham, when uh, which happened just prior to our game against Sheffield United, they were three one down as well. Came back and. I think they scored three goals in about eight minutes at the end of the game um, and, and turned West Ham over. So you can't take your foot off the gas, which which Fulham are slightly prone to doing against a Newcastle team like this when they have the amount of quality that they do in the starting 11, even with all those injuries. Um, you look at a player like Harvey Barnes, who scored a couple of great goals against West Ham. Isak, is, um, I think he's got 15, maybe 16 goals for the season. Uh, Bruno Gimaraes in the middle. Sean Longstaff's having a great season. Um, Dan Byrne, when he played against us early this year, completely shut down uh, anything we tried to do going forward. Um, it, it's it's not going to be an easy game for us, but when you look at the list of players who are missing, it's going to be a lot easier than it, it potentially could have been previously. Um, Skibby, how do you see Fulham winning this game? Do you think we're going to see some changes to the starting lineup and if so who would you predict coming in yeah i mean i was just sort of thinking about this while we were sort of looking at the side and i mean dan burn has predominantly played left back for newcastle this season so i was mm. thinking that you know stick a dharma down the right and we'll be laughing but i think with the injuries that they've now incurred that they now play dan burn as center back um mm -hmm. so i think we can't go the way that we have been in the last sort of couple of games, which is get the ball out wide and cross into Muniz because he's got no chance against Fabian Scher and 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 Burn because they're, they're just gonna it'll be reminiscent of the the um, Manchester United game at Old Trafford where it was was it over a hundred crosses or something and they just dealt with every single one of them. I can't yeah. see us troubling them for that. So I think for us that Willian has to start. I think mm. that's a no-brainer. He is our sort of creative outlet out wide um, on the left there. 
Um, Castagna for me has to come back in at right back. And I think we need to, I think consistency is key when it comes to defense. So I think we'll stay with, you know, Robinson, uh, Bassi, Tosin, and, um, and Castagna. Uh, I think we will probably, whether he will stay with Lukic, I think is going to be a big question because I don't think he necessarily had bad game as such uh, in both Sheffield and for um, Forest, but it's going to be a really key area that we need to win um, in order for us mm. to, to sort of maintain and keep ball. Their, their sentiment is very, very um, combative. So we've got to basically make sure that we are able to keep on the ball. So, I mean, I wouldn't, I see people talk about Kearney being really good defensively, but I just don't see it personally. Um, I agree. I, the game I, I that we saw defensively. The who game you, that we've just who, saw. Who do you talk to, Skibby? Who do you talk to? Oh, Twitter is just full of crazy <laughs> people, clearly. Mute um, those but, accounts instantly. <laughs> absolutely. But I was thinking, yeah, it's just Kearney is much better defensively, which I do not agree with. I think he's great as a luxury yeah. player. And to be honest, if we if we think we're gonna have more of the ball and we need to holdable then i think absolutely but for me it has to be lukic and uh Polina. and mm-hmm. i think it will be starts on the right for me with Pereira and muniz so i think that would probably be my side but i wouldn't start a dharma i think he's better off the bench and i think it will be as too class of a player to to leave out that i think at the moment it's kind of just picking the best players that we have around the pitch and finding where it will be will just slot in at the moment and for me that's got to be on the right yeah. Uh, go on, you go, Dad. Give me your thoughts. Uh, uh, nothing to add other than um, <clears throat> I, I'm hopeful, and I never thought I'd say this, I'm hopeful that uh, Castagna comes in for Kenny Tete. I, I, I don't dislike Kenny Tete, but uh, I'll always love Kenny Tete, but I think he is... I, I'm, I'm thinking it's... Probably just super rusty. I want to believe that he can be part of this, but I think he's played so infrequently that it's hard to it's hard to really see how he can be effective. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'd like Castagna back, fit and and absolutely pumping. And I I think I yeah I, I definitely want William to start. And uh, I'd, I'd take a Wobi over on the right over over Harry Wilson. Just, I think he's just a more reliable. We're more likely to get an impact from a Wobi than we are from Wilson on his day. Wonderful stuff, but it's too high risk to start him right now. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. I think. It's actually going back to what I think we all agreed was probably our best 11, which is to have Lukic in the middle, Iwobi out right, Willian on the left. Um, it, it just probably makes sense to maybe take a step back and go, right, this is this is our best team. Let's put this team out in the park, give him a kick up the arse during the week and say, guys, that wasn't good enough on the weekend. I think we all know that. He said he's going to have some individual talks with some of the players as well, and I, I think I can is. probably – pinpoint who those players are um <laughs> but yeah look i i'm quietly cautious cautiously hopeful um some of those words in the right order uh, i'm i i think this is an opportunity for us and I, I i see the injuries that they've got and i see players like emil Kraft playing at the back lewis hall playing at left back imagine lewis hall after 60 minutes having to deal with the dharma having had Iwobi on him all day, it, it could open up some opportunities for us as well. You look at Longstaff and Anderson in the middle for, for Newcastle. They're not established long-term Newcastle career players. These are guys who are sort of plugging gaps. It, it's it's in a similar fashion if we had to have, you know, Reed and Deckard over Reed playing centre mid for us at the moment. We'd mm. be thinking, geez, we, we're exposed here. And admittedly, Newcastle are a step above us in terms of quality. But even then, when you're having to play your backup players, there's going to be opportunities. 
And, and look, I, I think we we agree that Fabian Shah, Dan Byrne, they're very good in the air, but um, I'd say Brighton have a couple of centre-backs who are very good in the air, and Muniz kind of dominated them in a sense through mm. not not muscle, out-muscling them or out-jumping them, but his his movement and his ability to find the space. I'm, I'm hoping we see some more of that um, uh, this weekend because we, we didn't see any of it against Nottingham Forest. We saw a little bit against um, Sheffield, but uh, only in glimpses. I think we need to find uh, that again for Muniz. And, and interestingly, I think we, we talked about what does Muniz need to do to be considered a, a potential starting striker. And for me, it would be to show up against Newcastle, against two big centre-backs who always cause us issues and actually score a goal here or at least create a, a number of good chances because he, he scored the wonder goal against Sheffield but didn't score against Nottingham Forest. And I think seeing how he bounces back from that will go a long way into confirming or, or not confirming if he should be our starting striker next season. Uh, well, the, he, yeah. The the other thing that we've got to develop here pretty quickly, so Mooney's is no longer a secret, a West London secret, right? So it's it's not surprising that you're going to see him marked out of the game with possibly two players just following him everywhere. Mm. And I think we've got to adapt to that. And if if that is on, we have to adapt to that. And then actually <clears throat> use him to actually draw those players and isolate them, and 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 make those runs and take them out wide and actually counter that and so use it. And I don't think we're doing that at the moment. We're actually he's still trying to beat two men, um, and maybe he doesn't have the cunning at twenty-two to work that out because he's still trying to, you know, be kid eager and score every goal and beat three if he has to. And maybe Marco has to have a word and just say, okay, if the, if they do that, drag them out wide, take them right out of the game, yeah. and open it up. That's what you do. I mean, that's what you do in other sports all of the time on bigger grounds where players tend to move. I'm thinking AFL here, where players tend to move uh, forwards, tend to move in very wide areas. You just drag players out of the game. Yeah, uh, and often you'll leave, have a forward with 50 meters spare. And then it's one-on-one. I don't think you're going to find 50 metres spare at Craven Cottage, but the, the <laughs> you know concept still sticks. You um, know what I mean. Guys, I'll, I'll, it's it's a tough one to predict, but I'll, I'll ask you both for predictions for this game. Um, Skibby, you first. I am going to go 2-2 two, two draw. I think there'll be goals. I don't think Newcastle will shut us out, but um, I don't think... Either side has sort of the goal to win, so I think 2-2. Two, two. Dad? 2-1 uh, Fulham. Mooney's. I like. Mooney's, I like. Mooney's will score. Love it. Confidence. Uh, I'm going to just go out there because it doesn't really matter anyway and say 3-2 Fulham. Um, I, I agree. I think there's going to be goals. Newcastle have the ability to score out of nothing. I think Isak's going to cause a fair few issues for us throughout the game and Harvey Barnes and Anthony Gordon too. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to say 3-2 for Fulham. I think, yeah, I agree. I think Muniz is going to find a way against these two. He seems to step up against very good defences, um, more so than he does against poor defences, which is a weird thing to say. But, um, yeah, fing fingers crossed we get a result. Uh, to be honest, I'd, I'd probably take a point. Um uh, it's it's all about the way we bounce back from a couple of poor games for me. I, I just want to see that effort back again. I'd love to see early doors, Polina just absolutely clatter through someone in the middle and set the tone for the afternoon because I think that's what we're missing and that's what has made the last couple of weeks or last few days, I guess, so disappointing is the manner in which we're going about things and we just need to set the tone again and, and reset and, and hopefully Silver does that during the week at Motswell Park. Um, before we finish up, guys, we've got some questions come in from uh, a few people on Twitter. First one here from Gary Young uh, at Gazadexy40 on Twitter. How do you explain the disparity between our home and away form? Skibby, throw to you first. That's a question. I yeah, mean, I think it just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
we saw this before, right? This, what what year was it? It was like two thousand and six. It was under Hodge under Hodgson. Was it Hodgson? 20, where we went seven, winless eight, that kind of time. Yeah, that's it. We went winless away, but we managed to just absolutely turn Craven Cottage into a fortress. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm just getting flashbacks to exactly the same, where you know we're, we're getting respectable position in the league, but we're not doing anything away from home. I mean, for me, it just comes down to completely different conditions. People or the home team can set the pitch however they like it. They can overwater it. They can do underwater it, make it drier. And I think there's just that element of the conditions just aren't what we used to. People are aware of how we'd like to play and they just try to prevent it. I mean, we saw not saying it was poor tactics from um, Forest. I think it was completely... um, uh, weather related that it was a much mm. wetter pitch that you know we just couldn't get those sort of diagonal balls into Robinson and this ball would just skip off the turf and it just almost doesn't work and I think that's all it comes down to Craven Cottage is famously a much smaller pitch much smaller um, stadium than than others around the the league that we're just not used to I think I even saw um, players talking about their favorite pitches to play on they talked about um, like Old Trafford because the pitch is massive. And I think Mm. there's just elements of different conditions in terms of the actual measurements of the pitch. I think it comes down to the actual conditions of what the home team can manipulate. And I think it just works in their favour. And it's just something that every home team does. And yes, you just have to be very, very good in order to get over those conditions. But for me, I just think there's an element of it's just something that you can't train for and we're just not very good at expecting those conditions and we're playing way through them. We don't really have a plan B. Um, so if plan A doesn't work, we just seem to shit the bed and and that's what we're seeing away from home. Well, Anything to add to that, Dan? Because <laughs> yeah, I think it look, sums it up pretty well. But there's, I've got three things to say to that. Firstly, um, if we're a mid-table table team, then... Can you really be expecting to beat, say, the top six teams away who are just better than you? And yeah. in terms of the top six in this league, they're very good, you know, over the over the course of a 38-game season. So uh, it's, it's not really the fact that you should be winning how you know all of your away games to or, well even uh, the majority of them because as a mid table side you just won't but no but that, that still leaves 13 to 14 games that well no, 13 games that that you could win away from home and, sure. and we i mean we won at old trafford we we beat one of those top 6 we've only picked up three wins away from home this season i was going to yeah. say we took two points from sheffield united um Nottingham Forest and Burnley. Yeah, so it's like it's crazy. So, yeah. so yeah. if if doctoring the pitch <laughs> was such a big influence, how come Fulham are the only side that can't overcome that on the road? Because if everyone's doing it to the own, their own advantage, how come other teams actually do okay or don't have that huge disparity between home and away results? Are we really just that stupid or that inflexible or that poorly adaptable? I think it is a naivety thing because we yeah. we just don't seem to have a plan. We do play, try and play the same way we do at home. Whereas if you watch someone like um, West Ham, who I think is probably one of the most boring teams to watch, but they get the results and they will kind of set up differently away from home which is very very negative but they frustrate teams and and then they have the quality to get that point but i just don't think our squad and it's not in marco's way to to sort of sit in your hole and like almost play kind of you know flat back four palina dropping in to make it a back five with really low kind of wingers or one high winger one low winger just waiting for that kind of bounce where for west ham they have Antonio and Bowen kind of waiting to break and Paqueta kind of waiting to pick up the ball. We just don't play like that. And we just try to play really sort of possession-based, fast-attacking football 
which you can't. It's a, it's almost a naive thing to think that you can go to someone's own backyard and play the way you want to play because they're going to make everything, you know, in their within their control that stop you from doing that. And it's easy to watch a tape and just go, well, this is easy how to see how Fulham play. Um, and it's quite simple to stop, I think, personally. That's what I see. And I think it's just an element of <laughs> we need a plan B <laughs> to get more points away from home, which we don't seem to have. Well, the, the other side to this is that if if you are proven to be very successful at home, it sounds like you have a fortress, okay? And a fortress generally means incredible support. You just feel really confident at home. You know you're going to get be carried home by the crowd who are going to get revved up or going to actually lift the players. Um, I actually think we've had some very noisy nights at the cottage, but only when it's an exciting game and when the team are doing quite well. I I just don't think it's that kind of a place where regardless of how we're doing the the hammy end or any end or stand lifts the team when the team is actually not playing that well. That's not, Mm. it's, it's not what happens. So then is it simply the fact that we 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 don't like traveling? We just well, like we don't have the demographics of travel. We're we're homebodies and we like playing at home and we wouldn't mind a couple of games at Motspa Park because we're really at home there. No, uh, I mean I, I, <laughs> I went to I went to Newcastle away and it was pretty boring. Um <laughs> we don't travel, but I think it's just something mm. which we know we, we just don't do i think it's just something but then i think it, on the contrast though we talk about newcastle fans they live and breathe for their club mm-hmm. and they travel very well but yet they're still just as bad as we are away <laughs> so yeah, i don't yeah. think it's a, a factor personally i mean there's always a, a home advantage i think that's obvious that's why um you know in, in european football well not just european football but in any football where there's two legs, away mm. goals count f- as an advantage because it's so hard to get results away from home. Um, Fulham are generally and have been quite good at Craven Cottage. Mm. A- and I think we're just not as good at other teams as travelling at the moment. I don't know what that is. It might be down to maybe yeah. we need to start flying rather than taking the bus up to Nottingham. Um, uh, may- maybe we need a slightly better hotel next time and, Maybe we just need to change the schedules and tweak it a little bit. And, and these little things can make the difference. But it, it is hard to play away from home. There's no denying that. And I think that's why you can't really explain the disparity between our home and away form. Um, because if you look across the league, I don't think there's any team who's got a better away form than their home form. And, mm. and there's a reason for that. Um it's all about just doing as well as possible on the road. And and maybe we do need to go back to the days where um, under Hodgson, we did just set up not to concede and we hope to score goals on the counter. And, and it's all about, I, I think in that season as well, we we drew like 10 games away from home, but just couldn't pick up a win. So we were mm-hmm. still picking up points. It's very boring football, but oh, at, at least at least we were getting something out of it. But again, if we if we picked up an extra six points away from home this season, which is not out of the question, especially when you look at the last couple of games, that shoots us up the table. Uh, And when you get to the end of the season and each position is worth a couple of million pounds, you get an extra 10 million pounds in the bank. You potentially get European football, which adds even more because you're higher up the table. You get more TV money because you're getting more games covered live. Small things that make a difference, but, it is something that I think needs to somehow be addressed. How you address it, no idea. Um, mm-hmm. Next question. This one's from James Doughton, um, and it's about Tosin. Tosin, why does he play like he has a cigar in his mouth, so casual and a little cocky? Do you agree? Well, uh, again, don't start me, but um, I- I've always thought that Tosin was a fairly, he just looks like he's a pretty cocky guy. And it's okay to be confident 
even a bit arrogant, but you've got to be able to back it up. And if, if you're cocky and arrogant, you cannot be make you cannot be making silly errors, which just look like you you you, you have concentration problems because it just it just looks stupid. Um, but I, I I still quite haven't worked it out. I just can't fully understand where the guy's head's at. Um, you know, it you, you could be thinking he's he's um, inconsistency is because he's got his eye on the door and he's thinking about whether he's going to hire a private jet to his next gig or go first class. Um, but it, it can't be that he's he's had elements of this in his game for the last couple of seasons unless for that entire time he's been looking to leave. But even even so, professional players, even if they're unhappy with their present situation, the, the fact that they are professional means that they don't have huge dips in form and they, they don't display that kind of thing. I don't know. Um, I, I, I keep wanting to <clears throat> think the, the best of the guy, but... <clears throat> when I when I hear things like um, you know in that preseason in America when he was training on his own and things like that, it, it it's it's hard to look past all of those little things, and he just doesn't seem like he wants to be there, and he's really in the thick of it. He's one of the boys. Yeah, yeah, and he's for me he's playing like he's not playing like someone in a shop window he's playing like someone who already has offers on the table yeah um so i i don't i think come on let's be real his contract's up in 2 months and there's only about a month left of game time someone's put, someone's going to dangle a carrot in front of him and someone already has by the looks of things i think he's always going to be a high risk high reward type player where you know he's going to be picking out those hollywood passes from center back yeah they might not come off every time but and you might concede a goal if he completely gives the ball away like he did um against sheffield united but uh yeah for me he's too relaxed i would personally there must be a reason why he's playing instead of diop but i would personally play diop as someone who is a bit more consistent um and you know, has a mistake in him, but at least he will come back where this one, he just feels like it's not trying to better himself and just is just relaxed and complacent against the whole scenario, really. He didn't seem unfazed. Yes, he's got a goal yesterday, but, I mean, it was a very standard header, I think, but mm. I just think he's someone who already has offers on the table and I think he might be Audi. It's very confusing, though. Sorry, Jack. T to me, Marcus Silva seems like a guy that, geez, if you've got a bad attitude, you will not start. Mm. Oh, you'll be on the bench if I'm desperate for you through injuries or whatever, but you're not going to start. It's just, you know, I, I, I find it difficult to believe that he would reward that, and yet the, the, he's, that's exactly what he seems to be doing. Mm. I kind of agree. I think Tosin's probably out the door based on his demeanor, maybe his his manner. Um, I, I cigar in his mouth is a good way of putting it. To be honest, it is very casual. I wouldn't say cocky as such. I think maybe the the fact that he's holding out for a deal because he feels like he's good enough to play European football is maybe a little bit cocky. But when he's on the pitch, I, I think it's it's more the fact that there was one moment, uh, it was late in the game, it was one of Forrest's last chances, a um, bit of a counter-attack down Forrest's right, and Bassey was sprinting to get back, and Tosin was just sort of slow jogging, uh, and Tosin was the man who had to sort of cover it, but he just wasn't really putting in the effort. And I think maybe that's just the style of player he is. I've never really seen him put in full sprints for the ball. He always does look like he plays at a, at a bit of a slower pace. Um, and, and I'd rather someone like Bassey come in who's, um, you know, throwing himself around and kind of frenetic sometimes. If we lose Tosin, I'd rather find someone else in a similar sort of fashion who puts in 110% rather than maybe Tosin's just putting in 90 most weeks. Um, 
Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I do kind of agree with James's question there. Um, it does seem a little casual, and I, I'm not all about it at the moment, especially when you lose games. I can't think of a single player that Silva signed who has a casual attitude. Yeah, pretty much. Um, there's no doubting that Tyson's a, a high quality player, but it's 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 just those casual moments seem to cost us often. Um, a last question here. It's a two parter from um, David Crave, who can't join us on the live stream tonight, but um, is still able to chuck in his questions. Number one, why do Fulham tend to struggle after the international break? And number two, when we concede away, we often concede a second in quick succession. Is this due to a lack of composure and confidence or a tactical flaw? Skibby, you first. Um, so the first question, I think, is just purely down to momentum. We It takes us a while to sort of build up this momentum and we start to think, oh, yeah, we're doing really well. And then we have to have two weeks off. We've got quite a lot of internationals in our squad. They all go off to their individual camps, um, not to mention, you know, Anthony Robinson and um, Decadova Reed. They have to go off to, to sort of the Americas, which is not ideal, but hey-ho. Um, it's just one of those things, I think, it's just purely down to momentum, I think. Like I said, if you could keep a core group together over the break, we'd be much better but uh, you know you, you you lose a lot of players over to the um overseas when they come back you only have x amount of time to really knuckle down and work on the upcoming game so i think between the internationals and sheffield united we probably had the full squad in for what four days three days if that and i think it's just a lack of preparation that you just don't get um and how you combat that is kind of difficult when you when you're asking these players to multitask because you know you've got Anthony Robinson and co who's focusing on their National League final but you're saying but we have got Sheffield United coming up so you know watch these tapes of how I don't know Brereton Diaz makes his runs there's always going to be a conflict of interest I think and I think that's really what it comes down to is just the focus of where the players are at that point of time I actually think it's indicative of the style of play that that Marco is all about. Because if, if you are a, a Roy Hodgson type of manager that is happy to sit back and be tactical and knock the ball around, it, it's kind of training ground stuff in defence and then hope that, you know, you get the opportunity to make some runs. It's it's far less of a kind of a well oiled, high functioning, high mem high momentum uh, requirement to 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 be playing really attacking football all the time. You have to be on your best form. So as Kibi said, you break that up. I think you really suffer. Um, so so maybe you're always going to have this problem. If you know you, you you have these big gaps in your season of, of, of and a couple of weeks in the Premier League is is really quite a long time. If you think about it. Yep, I, I agree with that. Um, definitely, uh, momentum I think is huge for Fulham, and it is huge for all clubs who are um, lower in the table and and chasing victories every week to try and avoid relegation. It's all about momentum. And you see what it's like when Fulham go on a roll. We really go on a roll. And you also see what it's like when you're down in the dumps. You kind of get stuck there sometimes and you have to... It does take Fulham, it seems, longer than most other teams to, to build that momentum back up again. So international breaks, they never work in our favour. And, um, yeah, it's, it's not ideal for us at the moment. Um, in terms of the second question, conceding away from home, well, just conceding in general, we often concede a second in quick succession, I think. Um, I think it's it's probably a tactical thing more than confidence and composure. Um, as we've both sort of said, the, the way Marco likes to go about things is to try and win games. And I think when we go one down, we almost sometimes go a little too full out in attack to try and get one back and often find ourselves exposed. Um and occasionally maybe we switch off because we're looking forward 
rather than looking backwards a little bit and, and making sure that we're solidly sound defensively, we're focusing too much on going forward and actually scoring that goal to equalise or um, to get ourselves back in the game. Um, it, it's it's an issue and it's it's one that I feel like probably should have been addressed by now because it's it's not new. It happens far too regularly for my liking and it's something that it doesn't just happen against the big teams. It happens against every side we play against. And, and so that that really needs to be addressed. And maybe it's you can see the goal, you spend the next five minutes just controlling the game and, and staying calm. And, and I guess in, in that sense, it is composure. It's staying calm for five minutes post-conceding and not letting the, the tactics and the system just fly out the window completely, which it yeah. feels like we do a little bit sometimes. So you've talked yeah. yourself around. You talk to yourself. Well, around, no, I've, I've I've agreed with both kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. a tactical flaw which requires composure. Um, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. A good good question though, and it is definitely something that I I think that's the main thing that we need to address because we lose games or, or drop points more often than not by just not being in a position to get back into games because we do concede two goals very quickly. All of a sudden from, from nil all where the game's on, you're two nil down or you, you're one nil up and you go two one down and the game changes complexion completely. So it, it is, it's a huge issue that we have and I, I hope it's something that we do address and fix. Um, mm. Guys, I think we can probably wrap it up there. Um, I, I don't know how many people actually got my not in Nottingham title pun which is um a, a very dreary song from the robin hood disney movie um about how nottingham's just the worst place in the world and <laughs> i agree after this weekend so uh, sorry not after this weekend after the game on uh, on tuesday night um a, a disappointing one but i think we really do need to put it behind us and maybe not be too down on ourselves we've had a good season so far hopefully we can bounce back with a win against newcastle this weekend and turn things around for ourselves um skibby thanks so much for joining us today mate no worries thank you for having me and uh hopefully the next one is uh, a lot more chipper uh, and a lot more positive things to talk about rather than how awful we are fingers <laughs> are firmly crossed uh dad thanks for joining tonight yeah thanks so are you suggesting i need to reinstate my disney stream to stay relevant so i can keep up with your your headlines oh look this this was this was a deep cut earlier today when i was trying to think of a title for the podcast um definitely don't need to go back and watch it but actually i did put a link on on twitter for those who are interested in watching that little video it's a it's only a one minute long song but it uh it really sums nottingham up uh, perfectly so do do have a little watch um thank you to everyone who's joined us on the live stream tonight really appreciate it uh, appreciate all the support as always and as always come on you whites <laughs> <laughs>